I'm Lima Milan, and in this video, we're going to explore Abletonize Phaser Flanger device. So, this device does three different types of processing. It does phasing, flanging, and actually doubling of a signal as well. Now, for the depth of understanding of how each concept works, we're actually going to start on the middle concept, which is flanging. So, I've got a phaser flanger here, and I'm just going to load in a flanger setting on the device. Now, flanging is basically to create another copy of a signal that's delayed, but then to have an LFO, which is within the device, to modulate that time delay so it's not consistent, it moves around. Now, the way that the, the main premise of this device works is that modulation to that delay line in, in the terms of flanging, the way that it can change can be done in speed and it can also be done in how broad the actual movements of the delay line are. So let's just um, go for a dry signal to start with to play the example and then I'll play you the flange effect without any modulation and then we'll apply the modulation to get a sense of what it does to the sound. Okay, so we're going to go to a dry wet balance now. And then I'm manually just going to change the static position of the delay line. That's me manually changing that delay line that is now being blended with the dry signal. And you can hear a, a slight sense of flanging. But what we can do is enhance that by increasing what we call the feedback, which is to take the output and run it back to the input. So it's like an emphasis of the flanging side of the signal. So let's just increase the feedback. And it's really starting to resonate less harmonic uh, parts of the frequency. We're getting a resonance, like a metallic resonance to the sound. So now let's turn up the, the LFO modulation, so that a low frequency oscillator that is running at a certain speed, and it will change that delay line for us in an automated way. Now it should start sounding like the classic flanging effect that you may have heard on, on different records over the years. So the modulation speed can be altered either in synchronized measures using the rate amount here, or in a way that's not attached to the tempo of the song. It's more of a drift factor. Whether it's fast or slow, the start point is not necessarily synchronized with the playback of the uh, song. <laughs> Before we look at the actual modulator section and then run to the other types of processing in this device, the feedback control flips the polarity of the feedback loop. So as a signal is taken from the output, the flanging section, and passed back in for another run of going through the process, the actual uh, second copy gets flipped upside down and has a different interaction with the first generation of the sound as well, so it adds a different texture. So let's turn that on and off and see how that sounds. <laughs> It's a much thinner sound that we're getting out of that. It's a, it's a more subtle kind of flange. So I'm going to open up the actual toggle view here, which will show us the source of that movement, that modulation movement. So at the moment, the shape is a linear line, so it's going up and then immediately changing into a downwards uh, uh, descent, uh, which is the triangle wave. We can change that by changing the actual settings here, sine, uh, triangle, and uh, sawtooth, uh, sort of saw up and down as well, and so on. So we can choose that based on what we want it to do. I'm going to leave it as triangle for now. What I want to show you before we move on to the other effects as well is the nature of this modulation source. Remember, this is the source of why that flange delay line is moving. Uh, we choose how far it gets to move the delay line using the amount and the speed at which it moves using the frequency and then the emphasis of the effect itself using the feedback control. So we have the ability on the LFO to be able to actually change the behavior of how the uh, different delay lines in the flanger work. So I'm going to just sort of change the actual relationship of the signal. At the moment, the delay line on the left and the right speaker are almost exactly the same. They're slightly different because we get a sense of stereo, but they're, they're, they're pretty much uniform going um, 
to a higher and lower delay time based on the modulation that's being given. And what we can do is detach that by using this phase control. So I'm going to do that while it plays and basically just look at these two different dots that are here that represent the left and right channels. As you can hear, there's different degrees as to how out of uh, alignment or opposing alignment the left and the right channels are. 180 degrees is the absolute opposite on the left and the right. Now, that's a regular phase relationship change that we're changing with that uh, slider there. But if I move it over to the spin mode, which is like a stereo offset we can choose, and I click that, you'll see how the dots change in their relationship as to how they're moving. It's, it's kind of like a, um, a runaway effect of something starting to wobble and then run out of control as it gains momentum to, to keep moving. Um, and that relationship keeps changing between the two um, modulation sources on the left and the right signal. So let's go back to the phase alignment and just offset that. And then I'll switch it into spin mode while it's playing and you can see what the modulation is doing. So the velocity or the speed that the modulators on the left and the right are running at in phase mode are just offset from each other, whereas in spin mode, the actual relationship is two different speeds. So the left and the right are running at a different rate, which means that they sometimes are close to each other in terms of their alignment, and sometimes they're at the, the furthest away that they can be, and that just changes over time as well. So it's a nice effect to have in there to be able to, to change the, um, the, the relationship of the left and the right for, for detail and so on. So the last part of the modulation section, um, well, the second to last part actually, is um, there's an envelope section here, but I just reminded myself, there's also the LFO2 that's here as well. Now, what that'll do is add a second layer of modulation. So for instance, if I have this first LFO, which is the triangle, which we've just been playing with, moving the left and the right channels at different rates, LFO2 can change the properties of those balls as they're moving forwards and backwards but they'll still keep that first generation of relative relationship in, in process. So that will keep happening. If we increase LFO2 to the mix, we could set it very fast so it wobbles the, the actual balls as they move, but they'll still keep doing that relationship of moving forwards and backwards. So let's look on the actual the readout and it might make a, uh, a clear sense. <laughs> So as you can see, there's a kind of wobble to the, the balls moving now, which is caused by LFO2 being applied. But the first relationship of those two left and right uh, modulation uh, signals is still at their uh, initialized distance that they're, they're staying. So that's, as I said, the second to last aspect of the modulation. Let's move to the very final one and let's get rid of all of these different permeations of modulation from the LFO section. We have an envelope follower. Now, it can be disabled and enabled, but it's not actually going to do anything until we apply the depth amount. So that can basically pull the value of this time to go up with a positive range or down with a negative range. Um, so for instance, this is quite rhythmic, so this should work pretty much immediately. If we just turn this up, the envelope amount. <laughs> So what's happening is the attack and the release is tracking the volume changes of the signal that's going in, which is this whole song, because this is on the mix bus. And then based on whether you tell the attack to be as quick as the sound is, or whether you tell it to take a while and take a uh, be a, a slow reaction of going 
up with the modulation as the signal goes to a louder um, volume. We can make it track the rhythm or we can make it tr know what the rhythm is but be slow on the uptake and so on as well. So we can shape it to be rhythmic based on the sounds going through. <laughs> So that's very good for getting like a wah-wah kind of effect of a modulation, tracking the actual amplitude changes and the rhythm of the audio going in. So that's the flanging aspect of what's going on here. Let's move over to the phaser. So in short, because it is quite a complex concept, but phasing is like the way the feedback loop works. If you remember, I said the first pass goes out and runs to the input and it comes for a second pass, but with the phase button, it flips the audio upside down and therefore has a different relationship with the audio that was already there in the first place. That's what phasing does. They're called all pass filters and phasing can start with one all pass filter, which basically for a specific frequency, if that frequency was going up at this point, it flips it so it now goes down. And that will have a different relationship to all the frequencies that happen around the position of that all pass filter. And a phaser, as I said, can have one, but it can also have many of these different phase reversals within the signal. So it creates a really rich change of timbre. Um, so I'm gonna change the notches to be one all pass filter. And then I can choose the position of where it happens. So again, I'm not gonna do modulation first, just so it's visually really easy. Um, so we have one notch and I'll press play and you can hear what that sounds like. So it may to your ears sound very similar to flanging, but it's actually at one, it's a different process of achieving the effect. And secondly, it has a softening effect as well. Flanging tends to, if anything, become more resonant as you increase its application, as we heard with that metallic example. Phasing tends to have a bit more of a subtle, and as I say, softening effect on the sound at the same time. So I was just manually moving the center position for that first all pass. Of course, I can do exactly the same as we've already covered with the flanger, so I won't recap that. I can just turn that amount up. So that's the modulation happening. That's one all pass filter, if you remember. Now I can increase that with the notches control. So the, the notches are either going from a center frequency at the moment and spreading out, and we can have that center frequency uh, move position, or we can have it stay still. So I'll show you what I mean by that. If we have the notches up high, we can change the spread of those notches. So basically either compressing and condensing the distance between them or spreading them out. Now if we modulate that. Hopefully that's easy enough for you to see. You can see we can either have the blend control at its lowest value and the whole distancing shifts up and down or we set the blend to its highest control and the center stays static and we have this like expansion compression effect happening around that center frequency. So different sounds that we can get from it. And the other thing to remember is we also still have all those other modulation possibilities too. So moving swiftly on, we have the doubling effect too. And the doubling effect is basically to do a delayed copy of the signal and be able to modulate that as well. And it's multiple copies of the same signal being delayed. And then that modulation creates what 
it's traditionally called an ADT, uh, an automatic double tracking effect, which is a way to, it was done first with tape machines actually, to be able to play one tape machine with the same signal alongside another one. You deliberately speed up and slow down the second tape machine so it sounds like someone's trying to sing alongside it. So it was a really um, basic but effective way of trying to get the sense that you had two singers sing the same part. Um, so the doubling effect will be quite noticeable as soon as we play this. So it's very much like a, a, an echo at this stage, especially when the um, modulation amount is turned off for the signal. But as we apply the modulation, that's where we can make it sound a little bit more like the singer that's layering with the original singer is being slightly late sometimes and slightly early sometimes to fake that natural occurrence that we don't perfectly sing in time, uh, at exactly the same time with someone else. <laughs> So you can see in very subtle amounts, it just kind of thickens up more details behind the original signal. Um, and the, the last thing to mention before we finish on the phaser flanger is the warmth control here as well, which is a filter and a distortion unit in one as well. We should be able to hear this fairly obviously because there's a lot of information going through this. If not, I'm going to deliberately push some of the levels of some of the signals, uh, especially the bass, into this mix so you can really hear the effect of the warmth control. <music> So it gets you a, a vintage sound in respect that the uh, the high fidelity part of the signal dips a little bit like the old recording mediums did and also reduces the fidelity by the fact that the signal starting to distort as well. In this video we've explored Ableton Live's phaser flanger effect and we've covered the concept of flanger, phasing and also the doubling effect, how we can modify the properties using envelope followers and also LFO sources and then finally, we've also had a look at how the warmth control can add a certain type of vintage tone to our sound.